I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Go, go! Of the 50 plus novels written by horror master Stephen King, the ones that King's fans have been most eager to see hit the big screen are the eight novels of his Dark Tower series. And this weekend, their wish finally comes true, as Idris Elba's gunslinger hunts down Matthew McConaughey's Man in Black in what is hopefully the first of many cinematic adaptations of the Dark Tower. And this film is truly the culmination of over 40 years of Stephen King's terrifying tales making an impact on the pop culture landscape, with a little help from legendary directors adapting them to the big screen, ranging from the recently departed George A. Romero, to Stanley Kubrick, to John Carpenter, to Toby Hooper. And though Toby Hooper found success adapting King's novel Salem's Lot into a TV miniseries in 1979, he only found failure with his 1995 adaptation of the Stephen King short story, The Mangler. I remember the trailer for this flick, which hyped it up as the legendary teaming of three horror movie icons. Toby Hooper, the director who gave you the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Poltergeist. Well, sort of gave you Poltergeist. Robert Englund, the actor who played everyone's favorite wisecracking dream killer Freddy Krueger in the Nightmare on Elm Street series. And Stephen King, who wrote the short story that this film was based on, about a monster far scarier than any killer clown or killer car. A killer laundry press machine. <laughs> Yeah, no matter how many Masters of Horror you get to make a movie out of that story, it's not going to turn out well, with the film tanking at the box office and getting laughed away by critics. But as someone who's loved his fair share of Stephen King's stories over the years, I shall see if this movie lives up to the hype of that trailer, which I happened to watch as a kid quite a bit on the VHS tape of a Freddy Krueger movie, with that announcer's cool-ass movie trailer voice. Coming soon to a motion picture theater near you. Oh man, you know the announcer got all the ladies in bed with that voice of his. And now, our feature presentation. Oh god damn it, are you gonna come already or what? Coming soon. So we open up where most Stephen King stories open up, in a small town in Maine. And at the center of this town is the Blue Ribbon Laundry Service, as owned by the eccentric and leg-braced entrepreneur Bill Garton, played by Robert Englund. As the female employees do their load of laundry for the day, one of them, who happens to be Gartley's teenage niece, Sherry, cuts her hand on a lever and bumps into a pair of moving men carrying out an icebox, which causes her to splatter blood into the ringer of the folding machine. Later that day, tragedy strikes when the elderly Mrs. Frawley spills her bottle of antacids near the machine's ringer. Um, you know, you could just ask somebody to stop this machine so you could go ahead and get your antacids. Uh, maybe even use a stick of some sort to get them out of there. Or just buy another bottle of antacids. They're not that expensive. Or just stick your hand in the ringer like a dumbass and get smushed to death. Yeah, you could just do that. Stupid! You're so stupid! So they call in Detective John Hunton to evaluate the carnage, and he's played by Ted Levine. You know, with that trench coat, you could say his name should be Columb Buffalo Bill. <laughs> I'll just go sit over in that corner in shame. Ugh, poor guy. He shouldn't have had all those egg yolks for breakfast this morning. But after the safety inspectors proclaim there's nothing wrong with the machine, the suspicious detective chats with his brother-in-law, Mark, played by the winner of the Edgar Wright lookalike contest. And since Mark happens to be an English professor who's well-read in the dark arts, he suspects that the laundry machine is possessed by a demon from hell, and that when Sherry splattered her blood into the ringer, the machine developed a taste for human blood, uncovering an evil plot that Bill Gartley has made with the town's officials to sacrifice virgins to this demonic laundry press. In exchange for unlimited power as part of a pact signed with the devil. That's the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard. <laughs> hey, hey, don't fucking laugh at this movie, Lance Henriksen, because you're going to end up starring in the sequel. God damn you, God damn you. Yes, it's a little hard to make a great movie monster out of something that depends on its victims being complete dumbasses. Just don't go anywhere near the ringer and you will not die in a gory fashion. It is not that hard. I mean, shit, what's next? We find out that the mangler transferred its evil into that icebox and turned it into a killer fridge. It's all right, baby. Come on. Ah! 
Holy shit, I was just kidding! We're actually dealing with the killer refrigerator now? That's amazing! Miserable piece of dark fuck! That's right, Ted Levine. Beat down that refrigerator's ass before it goes on to terrorize Ellen Burstyn and Requiem for a Dream. You see what happens, Larry? You see what happens when you fuck a Maytag repairman in the ass? In fact, the guy who helps make this movie so hilariously awful is Ted Levine. His character is like watching the early days on the police force for Captain Stottlemyre from Monk, back when he was constantly drunk and pissed off all the time and didn't give a fuck about anything. And it's delightful to hear Ted Levine bark out his lines with that creepy deep voice of his. Look, don't start with the sprout breath political mystical bullshit, Mark. Are you threatening me? Is that a threat? Go on, threaten me. I'll shove them crutches up your moldy ass, you fucking clown. I'm really sorry, officer. Get this goddamn thing off of me! Numb nuts! Ooh, wait, what'd you just say? Numb nuts? Numb nuts! Numb noms? Numb nuts! Funyuns? Numb nuts! But I do not mean to shortchange the work of Robert England in this flick. The dude makes an effort. I just don't know what the fuck is going on with his performance, which can best be described as if George C. Scott played a hybrid of the Penguin and Dr. Strangelove, and he gets off some inappropriate wisecracks, which makes me think he thought he was still playing Freddy Krueger. Life's a bitch. Then you die. Hell's bells, Miguel! Do something! I'll do something! I'll dance! That's what I'll do! I'll do a little dance for you, Sherry! <laughs> well, unless you learn how to dance from Forrest Gump, I don't think walking around in a circle counts as a dance. Do it, nothing more! I mean, there's just so many weird and laughable elements to this flick that I'd be here all day trying to list them off. The guy who plays the creepy mortician is also the same guy playing the elderly newspaper photographer that Ted Levine keeps running into, but wearing heavy old age makeup. <sighs> Shit, this is Guy Pearce and Prometheus all over again. Why the hell can you just hire an elderly actor for that part? Then there's the foreman at the laundry factory who keeps changing the amount of gray hair dye he puts in his hair from scene to scene. But yet again, Michael McDowell is killing it in the acting department, yo. And at the end of the movie, the mangler fails to be exercised of its demons because there was a magic plant used as an ingredient in the antacids it ate earlier. Ah, oh, fuck it, it's stupid. And thus it becomes sentient and chases after our heroes, turning into the worst CGI effect this side of Mortal Kombat Annihilation and The Adventures of Pinocchio. I mean, what is it with New Line Cinema movies having such abysmal CGI effects? I mean, really? So no, this flick is not the amazing collaboration between three horror legends that it was hyped up to be. But much like he did with Life Force, Toby Hooper does try to give the silly idea some dramatic weight and impressive production design. And there's a whole lot of fun to be had in watching the failure of his efforts. Between the excessive gore and the campy performances, it's enough to overcome its slow spots to end up being a good time. Now if only this flick went down the same route as Maximum Overdrive and had an ACDC soundtrack, then it would have been even better. I I mean, come on, guys. It was right there. Hell's bells, Hell from the other side. Oh, no, God damn it, guys. That was your cue to play Hell's Bells by ACDC, not an Adele song. You couldn't have guessed that for me mentioning ACDC before it. Fuck it. Review's over. No nuts. Viewers beware. You're in for a scare. Once you sober up after another intoxicating round of the awfully good drinking game. Take a shot or drink every time the mangler attacks or kills somebody. Um, I'm pretty sure you could have just escaped by taking the jacket off. But yeah, shooting at it with your gun works too, I guess. Did you learn your gun etiquette from Chief Wiggum? <laughs> Whoa, that was close. Ted Levine pops another antacid. You know what? I don't like how this movie makes light of the very serious subject of antacid addiction. I used to be addicted to those fuckers. Man, when you ground that shit up and snorted up your nose, you felt like you were kissing Jesus' ball sack. <laughs> the newspaper photographer takes another picture. And the name of this character just happens to be, not even kidding, JJJ Picture Man. 
That sounds like a fake name a screenwriter would give a character until he goes back to replace it with an actual name. What, were these other characters once named TTT Policeman? RRR Evil Man? KKK Racist Man? Ted Levine mentions beer. What I need is a beer. Well, what the hell are you supposed to do about it, huh? Have a beer, that's what yeah, I'll what? do. Yeah, what? There's something important I want to show you. Six pack of beer? You know what? This gives me a great idea for a crossover movie. Ted Levine is hunted. Joe Don Baker is Mitchell. Together, they're two drunk cops. We can watch the ribs. Get this goddamn thing off of me! And take a double shot for the two times you see someone's bloody remains come out the other end of the mangler. Get away from me! Get away from me! Ah, uh, no need to cry. These women's remains are gonna be sent off to a better place, where they'll be taken care of by top men. Who? Top. Men. Arby's, we have the meat. And on the nudie watch, this flick ramps up far more on the gore than it does on the nudity. Which is for the best. Because when Robert England tries to make the moves on one of the girls at his factory, it's just downright creepy. Why don't you go in there and freshen up for your Uncle Billy? <laughs> Okay, Robert, your luck with the ladies is bad enough since you're famous for playing a burnt skin child murderer over eight movies, but having a loogie valve on your neck is sure as shit not gonna help. Hashtag loogie valve. On the enjoyableness continuum scale from Boulder Bruce, The Mangler is probably the closest thing we'll have to Stephen King literally writing a story about a killer lamp monster. <laughs> When can I have it? And mangles down a rating of 7 out of 10. Man, if The Dark Tower ends up getting no sequels, when even The Mangler managed to get two sequels, oh, now that is a scary thought. I'm Jesse Schaefer, JoeBlow.com, and since I'm gonna have to do another Stephen King movie review to tie into the IT remake coming out next month, I'm proud to announce Awfully Good Movies' first ever viewer poll! Here's how it'll work. I will give you viewers three choices for my next Stephen King review, and you can write which movie title you'd like to see reviewed in the YouTube comments or the Strike Back section of JoeBlow.com. So which Stephen King sequel do you want to see reviewed? Pet Cemetery 2, Lawnmower Man 2, or The Rage Carry 2. Write down which one you'd like to see, and I'll review the winner next month. And if you don't vote, I'm gonna send Ted Levine over to your house to beat your refrigerator's ass. See you then! Love nuts! Joe Blow, he sure likes to drink a lot! And Joe Blow watches movie like the hell!